Uh, hello, my name is Matthew, and I read Answered Prayers by Truman Capote. Um, in August, I always find myself being drawn back to Truman Capote. It's my favorite time of year to read um, his early short stories. Uh, this year, I thought I would go back to Answered Prayers. It's been a very long time, and this is uh, Truman Capote's last uh, unfinished novel. He worked on it uh, after In Cold Blood. Uh, he worked on it for the rest of his life and uh, only produced uh, three chapters. And I struggle. Uh, I, I didn't like the book. Um, and I, I struggle to uh, talk about it. I um, have kind of grown a distaste for um, reading a book that I didn't like and then making a, a video talking about all the reasons why uh, I didn't like it. I, I don't find it to be very uh, fun. Um, and this is uh, <laughs> this is Truman Capote's uh, Proustian Revelation. And I'll, I'll read some of the blurbs uh, from Newsweek. Uh, a Proustian revelation of life among the rich and famous. Capote produced a unique verbal music. And I've always thought of Truman Capote as a beautiful writer, a writer that wrote beautiful sentences, diamond-like and perfect, which he did. His early short stories, uh, some of his novellas, The Grass Harp, um, Breakfast at Tiffany's, In Cold Blood, uh, just a magnificent body of work. It unraveled uh, the second half of his career. Uh, the back, uh, a gift from an unbridled genius, exciting, irresistible, should be cherished as top flight work from a master. It's a Los Angeles book review. Uh, prose that makes the heart sing and the narrative fly, inspired. The New York Times book review. And this is um, much like uh, Remembrance of Things Past. It's supposed to be uh, this inside look into uh, high society. We're going to see all of these kinds of uh, people in a, in a reportage style. We're going to see um, uh, celebrities and writers, uh, actors, um, the way that they are um, off camera, behind closed doors. And this is an incredibly uh, sleazy, uh, slimy, oily book. All of the characters are sex maniacs, sex crazed, uh, perverted and perverse, um, drug addled and addicted, and cartoonish. And unlike Remembrance of Things Past, which uh, does give you an inside look into a whole um, rung of societies, um, it offers so much more. There's psychological insight. There's uh, digressions on uh, art, and literature, and architecture, and uh, history. Um, this is more of a gossip rag. It reminds me, and it, apparently when the chapters were published, it was scandalous. Uh, there were um, uh, dozens of people, uh, the, those circles around uh, Capote's uh, social network, um, either seeing versions of themselves or um, um, themselves uh, by name in, in the book, and uh, everyone's put in a poor light. Uh, it, it's almost like um, the real housewives of uh, somewhere or other, or the Kardashians that um, over-dramatized um, plastic 
false reality. Um, and through the book, um, there, we have this character, P.B. Jones, and we're reading this um, memoir or manuscript that P.B. Jones uh, is writing. And he uh, was an orphan who, um, just through really unfortunate situations, made his way um, into a, um, a failed writing career, a failed uh, socialite, um, dis disregarding any sort of uh, morality and doing um, anything he can to uh, make money or uh, gain notoriety. And through this manuscript that we're reading by P.B. Jones, um, he likes to remind us of how good of a writer he is. There's um, um, either hints or just obvious statements about um, how beautiful the last passage was. And it got me thinking about a beautiful writing. And uh, beautiful writing is perhaps hard to um, describe or explain, uh, but beautiful writing is not hard to identify. Uh, you know it um, while you're reading it. There's a, just a certain um, harmony or um, symphony that lights up inside, in your mind, in your heart, um, when you're reading something that's feels miraculous and beautiful, uh, a kind of writing that feels unattainable. Like, how could somebody uh, put together these uh, words in this way and create these um, sentences and passages, whole chapters, uh, novels, a whole body of work of just um, perfectly exquisite, beautiful literature? And uh, Capote, uh, Capote's early work, I, I do find um, much that is beautiful. I don't know if I would describe um, without um, qualification, I wouldn't describe Capote as a beautiful writer. So I thought I would talk about some of my um, favorite uh, writers or writers that I, I think were beautiful writers. Um, and for the English language, um, there's two that just immediately come to mind. They're, they're the writers that I think are the most beautiful writers in the English language. And that is John Keats and Virginia Woolf. And I thought I would read some passages. Um, and I was thinking about that tag or prompt called the page 112 prompt, and it's an idea of getting a representative um, taste of a book or a writer where you, randomly 112 is picked. You go to that page and you just get uh, a sampling out of context of um, how well the writer uh, is doing their job. And at first I thought it was just laziness instead of going through and um, trying to find uh, specific passages that uh, sing in my ears. Uh, but I do think it's a much more persuasive argument to randomly select a passage um, to show that any old page you pick, uh, you will find uh, magnificence and beauty. So for Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf, it's one of the copies that I have. Just go to 100, uh, page 112. Okay. Ah, dear, she remembered. It was Wednesday in Brook Street. Those kind, good fellows, Richard Dalloway, Hugh Whitbread, had gone this hot day through the streets whose growl came up to her, lying on the sofa. Power was hers, position, income. She had lived in the forefront of her time. 
She had had good friends, known the ablest men of her day. Murmuring London flowed up to her, and her hand, lying on the sofa back, curled upon some imaginary baton such as her grandfathers might have held, holding which she seemed drowsy and heavy to be commanding battalions marching to Canada, and those good fellows walking across London, that territory of theirs, that little bit of carpet Mayfair. Let me know what you think. Just beautiful. I think John Keats is the most uh, beautiful, uh, beautiful writer of the Romantic poets. Uh, he's not my favorite of the Romantics. Uh, unquestionably the most uh, beautiful. So this is from page 112. And we're in the middle of a poem. It's one of his long poems, uh, Endy Meon, however you say that, I don't know. And <laughs> there's long stretches where I don't exactly know what he's talking about, but the beauty uh, just sings and carries. It's un unreal. Uh, he wrote this as a, either a late teenager or early, early 20s. It's hard to comprehend. So, uh, page 112, Endymion. Thus spake he, and that moment felt endued, With power to dream deliciously, so wound, Through a dim passage, searching till he found, The smoothest mossy bed and deepest where He threw himself and just into the air. Stretching his indolent arms, he took O bliss, a naked waste, fair Cupid, whence is this? A well-known voice sighed, sweetest, here am I, at which soft ravishment with doting cry. They trembled to each other, Helicon, O fountained hill, old Homer's Helicon. Uh, now, when I think of uh, beautiful writing, um, my reading past and sensibilities often direct me to the French. And uh, with just a little bit of browsing through my shelves and a little bit of thought, um, not definitive, but uh, three of my favorite French writers that um, I consider to be some of the most uh, beautiful writers Theophile Gautier. Uh, I've read very little, uh, some short stories and a single novel. This is Mademoiselle de Maupin. And he just has th these sentences that feel like magic. I, I believe Gautier is the one that described his sentences uh, as a cat being thrown in the air. He can be as uh, daring and as inventive and as imaginative uh, with his sentences and they all have the uh, natural instinct um, to turn around in the air like a cat and land on all four legs so his sentences no matter how he throws them uh, always stick the landing and uh, so this is Mademoiselle de Maupin by Theophile Gautier, and we'll go to page 112 and read without context. And it's beautiful. <laughs> Happiness is undeniably pink and white. It has to be painted in those colors. It demands pastel shades. On its palette are sea green, sky blue, and straw yellow. Its pictures are all light-colored, like those of the Chinese painters. Flowers, light, perfumes, the, the touch of a soft and silky skin, a faint music coming from who knows where. These make for perfect happiness. Indeed, there is no other way of being happy, 
Even I, who have a horror of anything commonplace, and who dream only of strange adventures, strong passages, wild ecstasies, and bizarre and difficult situations, I have been quite ridiculously happy in that fashion, and in no other fashion, however hard I try. Marcel Proust, uh, the great uh, companion to Capote. So this is from In Search of Lost Time, probably my uh, favorite volume of the whole, which is the last, uh, Finding Time Again. This is the UK cover, which I just love. Um, the, the last book, I, I think you really get a sense that time uh, has passed for these characters. After thousands of pages, um, time has moved on. And uh, so, after thousands and thousands of pages, we go to uh, his last volume, on to page 112. And think about, I, th I think about the endurance, the calisthenics to produce a certain level of quality writing, but beautiful writing uh, that I really think signifies uh, what makes so much of um, what makes so much of great literature, which is um, a unique and honest voice. Uh, this is um, a really good representation of a writer's mind on the page. So, 112 of Finding Time Again, uh, the sixth book in In Search of Lost Time by Marcel Proust. Of course, I was familiar with the naive or feigned credulity of people who love someone or simply fail to be invited to someone's house and impute to the other person in question a desire which, despite tiresome solicitations, he has never manifested. But from the suddenly tremulous voice in which Monsieur de Charles uttered these words, from the uneasy look that flickered behind his eyes, I had the feeling that there was something other than ordinary instance involved here. I was not mistaken, and I will recount straight away the two facts which subsequently showed me to have been right. I anticipate myself by a number of years for the second of these, which was posterior to the death of Monsieur de Charles. This did not occur until much later, and we shall have the opportunity of seeing him several times considerably changed from the man we have known at a time when he had completely forgotten about Morel. As for the first time of these events, it happened only two or three years after the evening on which I thus walked down the boulevards with Monsieur de Charles. About two years after this evening, I ran into Morel. Immediately, I thought of Monsieur de Charles and how pleased he would be to see the violinist, the violinist again. And I pressed him to go and see him, even only once. He has been good to you, I said to, to Morel. Now he is old. He may die. You ought to put your old quarrels aside and wipe out the traces of your feud. And uh, the last... Uh, French writer that I picked that just came to mind as a marvelous, um, uh, beautiful writer is um, uh, Francois René de Chateaubriand. I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly. And this is from his memoirs, Memoirs from the Grave, uh, 1768 to 1800. This is the NYRB Classics, wonderful, handsome edition, and Chateaubriand lived uh, 
three lives, ten lives, uh, two dozen lives worth of um, activity. He, he was uh, restless and uh, successful. He had huge successes and huge failures. Uh, he was constantly on the move and traveled widely and wrote his entire life. And uh, there's um, excitement in his life. And th this is just an incredible uh, memoir. Um, I'm not sure how reliable it is um, of just a, a fascinating life. On top of that, uh, it is some of the most beautiful writing that you can uh, come across. So um, page 112, and it's the beginning of, um, we'll say chapter nine, uh, and uh, here we go. Let's see. Back from Montbossier, here are the last lines I shall write in my hermitage. I have to abandon it all, even the handsome saplings in their close set rows, which were already beginning to hide and crown their father. I will no longer see the magnolia that promised its flower to the grave of my Floridian girl, the Jerusalem pine, the Lebanese cedar dedicated to the memory of St. Jerome, the laurel from Granada, the plane tree from Greece, the Amorican oak at the foot of which I depicted Bianca sang of Simodosi invented Vallada. These trees were born and grew up together with my dreams. They were their hamadryads. Now, they are about to pass under another's sway. Will their new master love them as I have loved them? He will let them rot. Maybe he will cut them down. I can keep nothing on this earth. In saying goodbye to the woods of Olaney, I shall recall the goodbye I said to the woods of Comburg. All my days are goodbyes. And we have Proust, uh, we have Truman Capote, uh, answered prayers, his Proustian revelation. And <laughs> There are beautiful passages. Uh, there's beautiful moments. But this is uh, book three, uh, La Cote Basque, however you say that. Um, overheard in a cowboy bar in Roswell, New Mexico. First cowboy. Hey, Jed. How are you? How are you feeling? Second cowboy. Good. Real good. I feel so good, I didn't have to jack off this morning to get my heart started. <laughs> Punchy. Not beautiful. Um, so, um, if, if you're watching, uh, I would love to know uh, some of the writers that you think are um, uh, beautiful, uh, the writers that just uh, write um, that certain kind of beautiful uh, language. Uh, there's, there's so many qualities that make a great writer. Beauty isn't necessarily one of them, or it's not um, a, a necessary quality, but um, all of the writers that I've mentioned, inclu including Capote, um, have, um, you know, that uh, commanding voice and interesting characters, um, gripping plot lines, and all of the things that can make great story and storytelling. And on top of all of that, uh, they tell it beautifully. So um, leave a comment if you would like. I would love to hear some writers that you think uh, uh, wrote beautiful stories. So uh, thank you for watching and take care.